to Home Health 360, a podcast presented by Alaya Care. I'm your host, Jeff Howell, and this is the show about learning from the best in home health care from around the globe. Hi, folks, and welcome to Home Health 360, a podcast where we speak with leaders in home health and home care from across the globe. Today, I am joined by two guests. We have Dr. Joseph Jasser from Dallas, Texas, former senior medical director at Cigna, former president and CEO of Dignify Health Medical Foundation, former president of the care delivery organization at Humana, former chief medical officer at Signify Health and formal chief medical officer at Alara Caring. That was a mouthful. Dr. Joe has recently joined Vesta Healthcare, a leading technology and clinical services organization dedicated to connecting caregiver insights and is focusing on partnering home care, health plans, and providers to create value-based population health programs that emphasize clinical quality, improved health outcomes, and personalized engagement. Dr. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the uh, warm welcome and the uh, kind words. And we also have a man whose fadeaway jump shot in the Midtown Toronto Men's Basketball League is still talked about 10 years after his retirement. He's gone on to have mediocre success as CEO of Care, a home health software company that has raised $350 million and employs 500 employees with offices throughout Canada, Australia, and the United States. He's also known in some circles as the second most electrifying man in home health. Adrian Schauer, welcome to the show. Well, it's an honor to be here with the most electrifying man in uh, home health care. So uh, thank you for teeing that up, Jeff. (laughs) I won't say I'm the most, but if you're listening to this and you want to Google most electrifying man in home health, you can see what Google uh, provides to you as an answer. (laughs) So, Joe, over to you. Why don't you give us a little bit more background about your career path? I'd be glad to. And a uh, um, good way to open up the conversation. I know you said there's a lot of formers. Um, I've had a long career, um, made a quick move from internal medicine into administrative medicine and landed over at uh, Cigna Medical Group as one of my first uh, forays into uh, managing clinicians and uh, clinical performance. Right at the time, timing was good, uh, right at the time of uh, when uh, HCCs became uh, into existence, um, and uh, it was a fully capitated uh, medical group with uh, exclusivity to uh, the Cigna uh, Medicare Advantage plan in uh, in the market. Uh, Quickly learned um, how to manage uh, physician uh, performance and value-based care, as well as um, how to uh, maximize... uh, coding and uh, and the uh, revenue capture associated with uh, HCC coding. Um, Got uh, recruited into Dignity Health Medical Foundation. Um, Interesting story was that uh, the individual that was, uh, that brought me over to Dignity, we were negotiating the inclusion of my medical group into uh, the Dignity ecosystem in Phoenix. So uh, we became uh, colleagues and uh, shortly uh, after he started recruiting me, I made the jump over to California and ran uh, the, the uh, foundation for uh, Dignity Health um, in California. That is the ambulatory care system uh, f- that supports the hospital. We had over 120 clinics across California, five major medical groups, uh, one of which I established while I was there and uh, um, grew it from roughly 500 doctors to almost 900 doctors in uh, uh, about four years. Um, It was right at the time when, once again, timing was good. It was right when hospital systems were diving deep into ambulatory care and growing their footprint as fast as they possibly can. Uh, We were acquiring groups uh, sometimes in in the double digits per month um, uh, during that uh, four-year stretch. Um, The uh, tables turned. I got a chance to... to, to, uh, to join Humana, um, got recruited over there to uh, run their primary care physician group down in South Florida, as well as the partners in primary care um, uh, across the country. Um, had a great time being a part of the executive team over there, great experience, and uh, really got to understand and, and, uh, and appreciate the market dynamics in a very um, heavily uh, penetrated MA market, and that's South Florida. Um, and the differences in the dynamics there as opposed to California was very uh, educational. Um, and then um, took some time off and then I got uh, recruited by Signify Health 
uh, to uh, bring up their chief medical officer, uh, the office of the chief medical officer, as well as their clinical, uh, the entire clinical infrastructure over there. Um, the uh, one thing that was interesting is I left them right in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was right as they were unwinding everything from going in home to virtual, um, as well as uh, prepping to go public and uh, it was, uh, not being able to travel and not being able to get uh, to places made it difficult. Um, considering the fact that the entire organization was in New York and they uh, um, they were moving hard and fast, uh, building out the executive team up there. So um, opted to uh, uh, step into home health after that and uh, got recruited by Alara. Um, and uh, the move from Signify to Alara Caring was a natural transition. Um, if you really think about it, uh, Signify was doing the uh, in-home assessments for uh, Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and uh, the, their, their goal and what I was brought in to do was to build up the complex care management component of it. And, uh, you know, with uh, home health being the, the easier entry into complex care management and uh, managing patient conditions in the home, um, my passion followed me into Alara and uh, was there for approximately a year and a half um, as things unfolded and uh, made the move over to Vesta uh, for the sole reason of giving, uh, continuing the passion around delivery of uh, health at home. Um, and the one aspect of the market that I felt that had the greatest opportunity where everybody uh, seemed to be missing was the caregivers. Uh, caregivers in the home are an essential part of the overall uh, healthcare delivery ecosystem. Um, and uh, the, providing them support and uh, clarity and information to what's happening, uh, I think, is a great opportunity for us as caregivers um, and healthcare delivery professionals to make an impact and a difference in the world. So yeah. that's my 30, you know, what minute and a half, uh, career, uh, that took yeah. me 20 years to get here <laughs> but, um, it, in a minute and a half. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a lot of great work there. I'm excited to get uh, a clinician's perspective and, uh, someone that's uh, in technology as well. So Adrian, you have a, I think it's a master's in photonics and, um, you uh, entered the, the the mobile world, and um, from a technology background, you uh, you end up coming into home health. Give us a, a, a history lesson of who is Adrian Shower. Well, I won't take you all the way back to my photonics degree because uh, that's <laughs> not that, that's not adding much value to my uh, my day to day profession <laughs> nowadays. But it's true; I have an engineering background. I got into the software startup game uh, back in two thousand four initially with a mobile marketing business, uh, which then led to a mobile workforce management business. And these were the early days of a smartphone showing up in the hand of, uh, you know, every worker that was out there, not at their desk all day. And uh, so we really leaned into the potential to transform how work is done, but we were a horizontal solution. So we were using the same app to manage scheduling and task management and time and attendance for nurses retail employees, oil rig workers, cops. And uh, it was a good way to go at the market in the early days. Uh, but uh, as markets mature, you really want to get into more of a vertical where you can really understand uh, the day-to-day -day of your customer and go much deeper in terms of uh, the value you provide. So um, that the business at the time, Vortex Connect, got acquired in 2012. And then in 2014, we launched Alaya Care. And, uh, you know, in that gap, I'd married a doctor. I'd seen a little bit of how um, care was moving out of the hospital, out of the four walls of the hospital and into the community. And uh, we'd, we'd had some home care customers at Vortex Connect. And I really felt like this was a market that had huge growth potential that was not particularly well served by really uh, inspir inspirational software companies. And it seemed like a great opportunity to dive in and uh, an area where we could do well by doing good. That's great. So I'm going to go to the uh, sort of the burning question uh, that pre people want to hear about is that uh, March of 2019 hits. Uh, Dr. Joe, you actually made a career change shortly after COVID hit. I'm curious to hear from you um, how things were handled at both organizations that, that you were at. That's a great question. And uh, they were uh, completely, they're, they're extremely similar organizations, um, had similar challenges, but were coming at it from the difference of one is as an essential service and the other 
um, was a nice to have service. Um, so the way that uh, the market perceived them was different, which was really interesting. And th- that led to the approach of how the companies uh, leaned in on what was happening around them. Um, you know, when, if you take a look, I'll, I'll kind of uh, start off with Signify. Um, you know, Signify doing uh, in-home annual wellness visits for Medicare Advantage members uh, considered a non-essential service uh, because it is an annual wellness visit. And then obviously uh, going into patients' homes uh, at the time of the pandemic where there was so much uncertainty was not ideal. Um, so their, their position, and, and as I navigated it with them, um, was to really look at the opportunity of moving majority over into telemedicine. Um, so we immediately pulled all the doctors out of the homes uh, as quickly as we possibly could, um, you know, managing the, uh, the clients, the, the large payers, the Aetnas, the Humanas, the Anthems of the world, um, ensuring that the patient population was well-serviced. Um, but at the same time, building out the infrastructure and moving the organization to telemedicine, um, which was right at the same time that uh, CMS provided us with the waivers uh, with, for the telemedicine waiver uh, for all types of visits, opening up the, the site of service in the home as a possibility for uh, annual wellness exams using telemedicine. So the, the approach there was a lot different uh, as opposed to when I made the move over to Alara. Um, by that time, uh, Laura was, you know, still cons- going into the home. Their challenge was mainly procuring PPE, ensuring stability of the business, ensuring that the safety of both the patients and the staff uh, through the pandemic. Um, so completely different uh, perspectives. And, and since telemedicine was a service and CMS came out and noted that uh, although telemedicine can be leveraged in home health, it's not a billable service. So um, it didn't provide the, the luxury uh, that it did for Signify. In other words, the services changed from in-home to telemedicine with no disruption for home health. Using telemedicine would add uh, to the workflow and add to the vo- uh, work volume as opposed to uh, making it easier for the clinicians. Um, that that uh, brought even more difficulties and challenges, which is maintaining the PPE, maintaining the uh, the ability to go into patients' homes effectively, as well as dealing with all the um, quarantines. Um, there was ter- times uh, that Alara was uh, roughly, uh, you know, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten percent of our workforce in some regions were out on quarantine, and in some regions, uh, upwards of twenty five percent. Um, makes it very difficult to maintain operations in those cases. So the 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 impact was different. The approach was completely different um, when you look at uh, the the business and the ability to to keep patients safe and keep uh, the caregivers uh, going into the home. Um, now, fast forward uh, to where we are now. Um, signifies back in the home, doing it safely with PPE. Uh, Alara never missed a step and actually got the pickup and the, the upswing, as uh, Adrian noted. Care is moving away from the clinic and into, uh, into the home. And, uh, you know, the, that growth has helped propel not only uh, Alara, but almost every home health agency uh, into a 2021. Challenges still persist and still uh, still remain uh, consistent across the board. Um, now I'll even add that the vaccination challenges are adding another uh, layer of complexity into the overall uh, uh, ecosystem. So it's been interesting to see how the different uh, healthcare companies have approached this. And talking with a lot of my CMO colleagues, uh, some at the hospital, you know, they're they're no different there in dealing with the. Uh, Um, PPE and then the safety of the the staff and the safety of the patients and still maintaining operations when the volume is going through the roof with COVID patients. So it's, uh, um, it's interesting. I'd love, you know, I'd love to hear Adrian, what you kind of heard, because obviously you're in a multitude of different areas and see things from a different perspective than I do. I would love to hear what you saw uh, in some of the uh, companies that you work with. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, one of the interesting things as a cloud software provider is, you know, we're able to see uh, on an aggregated level what's happening to visit volumes across everywhere we do business, right? And, you know, so we see over a million patients, you know, hundreds of thousands of caregivers across multiple markets. And, um, you know, as you would expect, mid-March, boom, volumes, volumes drop. And uh, for everyone, 
right? Even, you know, if you think of Australia, there were a handful of cases uh, back in mid-March, but, you know, you really knew you were in a global media market uh, the way everything moved together. Um, but providers in markets like uh, New York City saw that, you know, that really were, uh, were dealing with um, major outbreaks uh, in that kind of mid-March timeframe, they saw generally the steepest drops. Uh, on In aggregate, uh, those first kind of 45 days saw 10 to 15% volume de- decreases, but uh, the New York providers took the, the biggest early hit, both caregivers uh, calling off and uh, clients saying, well, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable having someone come into my home. So there was that uh, initial drop. And then uh, the volume of care really did follow a V-shaped recovery curve. So as of uh, end of April, volume started re- to recover. And uh, it was a good way to, to see how essential a lot of the, uh, the home care really is, uh, you know, the skilled and the personal care. So volumes came back uh, in general, but uh, there were some areas that uh, took a lot longer to come back. So uh, in markets like Canada, we support a fair amount of uh, outpatient rehab, and that had that was very slow to recover. And in fact, uh, I still don't think they're back at pre-pandemic levels. Whereas uh, most of the care in the home, you know, be it uh, be it skilled or personal care, um, in general, everyone is at least back uh, and generally higher than they were a year and a half uh, ago when the pandemic hit. Interesting, interesting, and and Jeff, sorry, I'm going to ask uh, Adrian some questions, but please, please do. Trigger yourself. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that fascinates me. I met with some folks from uh, Australia, uh, the mm-hmm. the CEO and the COO for their largest health plan down there, the United of Australia. Uh, without yeah. sharing names, I'm sure you can connect the dots pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Back when I was at Signify, um, and learned a little bit about the Australian system, and it'd be interesting to see from your perspective, since you're doing business in Canada national healthcare system. Uh, Australia, government-supported national healthcare system as compared to the U.S. Um, and I say specifically from a continental perspective, because Canada and U.S. to me are almost one and the same when you look at the impact and the flow of, of people, where Australia is sitting on an island almost. Continent, obviously. But <laughs> yeah. Literally. Literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah. Not all the the world, <laughs> that took the most aggressive stance from a health, you know, from a world health care organization perspective of shutting the borders down, shutting everything down. Yeah. How did you see that kind of play out in regards to the volume recovery and the impact of the business? I know we all saw the drop in March. And then that kind of a slow, but almost like a V-shaped recovery as we yeah. finished off 2020. It'd be interesting to see what the others did. Yeah. So very interesting. Australia has been quite out of sync with North America. So for example, uh, right now, New South Wales, Queensland are in full lockdown, right? They, they took a very different strategy. Their strategy was, let's get our cases to zero. Right. As you say, it's an island, pulled up the drawbridge. Eventually, they two country bubbled with uh, with New Zealand, but they really pursued a strategy of uh, we're going to just contact trace every case and try and get to infection zero. But at the expense of uh, a really solid and accelerated vaccination program. So uh, they are way behind North America on on uh, on vaccination. And so now, uh, with the the spread of Delta, the you know getting to case count zero is not a really viable strategy. Yet you're behind on vaccines; they're in a tough spot. Uh, so they're you know they're literally in lockdowns, like many parts of North America were a year ago. Uh, but there were there were other times. Um, you know, I might get my date slightly wrong, but uh, you know if I think of January, February, 2021. I mean, at least here in Canada, we were on lockdown. Australians were going about their business, right? The only difference was they couldn't come and go uh, from the the continent, but, uh, you know, it was was quite a different pattern. So so they had a different rhythm um, than we had over here. In terms of the impact on, uh, on home care, because there were never a lot of infections, 
they had a much lower adjustment. You know, the the amplitude of the ups and downs uh, were lower. Um, we also support the residential uh, aged care sector there. So um, they had some outbreaks in uh, their long-term care facilities, but nothing like uh, what you saw over here. So, and Adrian, do you have any thoughts on why it's such a low vaccination rate over there as well? Well, they uh, they have no domestic uh, vaccine production mm-hmm. uh, capability. I mean, they leaned into building uh, capacity to manufacture the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, which then, you know, subsequently many countries moved away from. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, they weren't as aggressive in procuring vaccines as, for example, Canada was. And we also don't have domestic uh, vaccine production. But um, uh, yeah, so so it was just, a, you know, a strategy and a procurement question. Now they're catching up, you know. But uh, if you remember... That, uh, like from December 2020, when there was an approved vaccine, um, you know, and the U.S. was in its, uh, you know, doing 2 million people a day, um, it was very hard to access vaccines in many other places in the world, right? Including Europe and, you know, all sorts of other places. So, um, yeah, we sit here now, you know, anyone can walk into a Walgreens and get a get a vaccine, um, but you know, that wasn't the case not so long ago, and it's still not the case in Australia. They're coming down the age groups uh, like we did here. I think they're only down to to 40-year-olds, you know, as of a month ago. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a a time warp. Interesting. interesting. In in regards to the impact of the home health care industry, I mean, obviously, have they recovered? Um, you know, has their their healthcare system? I know they're they're awful close. When I look at you know from a healthcare perspective as a, as a physician, looking yeah. at their case counts and that sort of stuff, one, it's a, extremely impressive. But it, like you say, it comes at a cost of lockdowns and extreme yeah. Big Brother, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, which one can argue either way. Uh, Sweden took a different approach, and we all landed in the same place. Um, so, but the, the question is, from a business perspective, a home health. You know, we saw that, and we obviously the vaccinations. Um, almost electrified the entire uh, home, uh, the, not just home health, but the entire healthcare industry opening back up. Yeah. Um, now, without vaccines down in Australia, is the recovery still happening? Is it not? Um, and the same thing, con- contrast that with Canada, uh, because to me, what I'm looking at is fee for service medicine versus national health care right. and the impact the governments did on controlling yeah. the virus. I mean, I think there's a, there's a cultural angle that can't be left out of that analysis. So if you look at Canada, we're now at 87% um, first dose vaccination, 77% uh, fully vaccinated, you know, across eligible, you know, 12 plus adults, Uh, you know, and the U.S. is stuck, you know, it's more or less plateaued uh, at a lower level than that. So uh, I don't think that's about legislation or how the health system is organized. No, I think we just uh, in Canada. Anyway, I'll speak for Canada first. Um, there's there's just a greater trust in institutions, and um, you know uh, we're we're in a similar information ecosystem. But uh, for whatever reason, you have cultural differences here. For the most part, uh, you know people are just getting vaccinated and going about their business. So um, it's not a hot. I mean, there are pockets, but in general, it's not really a hot button issue. Uh, you know, no hospital here would hesitate to mandate, you know, to tell their care workers they all need to be vaccinated and they would see very little pushback from that. So uh, so I think that's generally a cultural difference. Uh, everything I've seen in Australia to date uh, is much more like Canada. You know, as soon as people can get the vaccines, they get them. Um, but uh, there's still a fatigue, you know, a lockdown fatigue. And there are protests now in Australia against the lockdowns, um, but not much pushback against getting the vaccines. Yeah, there was even a period of time. I'm in uh, a suburb of Toronto and uh, for probably six weeks, Ontario, the province of Ontario was the only place in the world where you couldn't golf. <laughs> <laughs> And the type of golf I play is very socially distanced because I'm nowhere near the fairway. (laughs) 
Well, let's talk about some trends in home health. Maybe if you guys can weigh in on where, where you think were some dominant trends prior to COVID and um, has COVID helped uh, accelerate or decelerate some of those trends? I know, Adrian, you've said that Aliacare did about five years worth of development in five weeks because it was um, just all hands on deck and it was a necessary pivot. So Dr. Joe, like you said, um, when you saw this heavy investment into telehealth, obviously these non-essential visits, you can't give a bath to someone virtually, but you can rethink and you can start to create virtual teams or you can segment your teams into in-visit teams and virtual teams. Give me a sense of um, what you guys see as maybe some silver linings coming out of what uh, COVID has done to us. You're, I'll, I'll let the tech speak first because clinical <laughs> uh, is a different perspective. So I'd love to hear it actually. This is intriguing uh, on yeah. what, what you're seeing from the technology standpoint. Yeah. Well, uh, again, this is where uh, I just have a lot of empathy for anyone trying to run their business during COVID. I mean, we, we went fully virtual and, uh, you know, we were ready. Everyone was on laptops. All of our, every app we use was cloud-based. Uh, so it was relatively seamless for us, at least from a, an IT point of view. Uh, but what we saw is as that wave of, you know, virtualize everything you can uh, hit the, the home healthcare sector, uh, that was a real tailwind for us because, you, you know, you need a cloud solution you can access from anywhere. You need good communication tools that let you um, collaborate with your colleagues, but in context of whatever you're doing. And we, you know, we happen to deliver the mission critical application for our customers. So all your clinical, all your operational data uh, kind of lives within Aliacare. And so there's a real acceleration in, hey, you know, my business process that used to sort of work in the office where my intake person would, you know, hand some paper over to the scheduling person. I mean, that was done. So it was an acceleration of how do I get great workflows mediated by cloud software to run my business and run my whole business, you know? So yes, there were impacts in the field, but I'm talking about every aspect of um, uh, coordinating, delivering care and getting it billed and getting it paid. So, so that was one interesting shift, uh, just an acceleration. Uh, of course, then, as Jeff mentioned, you know, telehealth, remote monitoring, um, you know, COVID screeners, contact tracing, all the tools you need within your system to be able to operate as safely as possible during COVID, um, you know, got a, got a huge push at the beginning of the pandemic. But then outside of just the technology angle, you know, COVID changed a lot of things in the economy and in the labor force, as well as in how care is delivered. And so, uh, you know, we've now seen an acceleration in uh, mergers and acquisitions in this space because capital is extremely uh, plentiful and available. Um, we've seen a continued merging of skilled and personal care. So, you know, Alara being a, being a great example, uh, the large providers are seeing the trend towards uh, value-based care and, uh, and risk sharing and are saying, well, you know, if I'm going to care for this patient in their home and try and get the outcomes uh, I'm economically incented to get now, I mean, I need the full range of tools at my disposal, which is, you know, nursing therapy, kind of clinical interventions, and then, uh, you know, all the assistance with activities of daily living and everything that goes around uh, kind of whole patient care. So, uh, so we've seen that uh, that accelerate, and the multi business line agency, um, I think, is going to become a more and more dominant force in the market, and I think the big will continue to get bigger. And uh, just today, actually, we saw a huge merger in the marketplace with LHC Group. So we're we're starting to see more deals, uh, and and uh, I saw a chart recently about. Um, there's actually not necessarily more deals l this year than there was last year, but the deals are actually getting bigger. Yeah. yeah. I think Jeff, that's that, uh, I was going to comment a lot on what Adrian was alluding to on the, on the tail end of what he was saying is, um, the, you know, the market has shifted dramatically as COVID, uh, kind of took its toll, so to speak, uh, on a lot of the home health agencies, uh, the smaller mom and pops, 
uh, couldn't get, didn't have access to the PPE as effectively as the larger players. That was a big a key portion of it. Um, staffing was a big key portion of that. Um, and, and, you know, looking at the margins, it's hard to maintain operations uh, consistently when you're dealing with those two. So what we started seeing was considerable consolidation across uh, the industry. Um, so, uh, and it is still one of the most fragmented industries across uh, the U.S. Uh, home health cost of entry is very inexpensive. So you see a lot of these mom and pops uh, come up. Um, but consolidation is something that has been actively happening. But the since COVID, um, I mean, intensified rapidly. Um, I mean, and I think the, the icing on the cake of that is uh, Imana's acquisition of Kindred, finalizing that uh, that overall uh, acquisition. Um, and to your point, Adrian, in regards to the, um, you know, multiple verticals, um, you know, Alara is not alone in the, uh, you know, having hospice, home health and uh, PCS together stitched into a, under a single umbrella. Um, you take a look at the medicines of the world, you look at the accent cares, they're all doing the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the key play here is what I'm seeing is market density. Um, yeah. So they're identifying the markets that they want to go into. And doing the, the strategic acquisitions and or uh, mergers uh, to uh, to build up that market density in the areas, so that way they got not only horizontal integration but they got vertical integration across their products, um, which really helps. Um, you know the the other thing that I'm seeing uh, move very hard and fast is the movement to value based care. To your point, Adrian, mm-hmm. uh, where I don't see it happening is the MA plans finding value in home health. I mean, you know, the MA plans are struggling finding. Uh, the, the value, uh, you know, the way Humana sees it with Kindred. Um, I think a lot of it is because home health is a commodity. It's a, uh, um, it's the, it's the, the, it's the easier point of entry for healthcare um, when it comes to uh, pricing. But what they aren't seeing is what CMS is pushing towards uh, here in the U.S. is uh, the home health value-based purchasing. They're resurrecting the from 2019. They're bringing or 2018 is when it uh, went in. 2019 is when it died, bringing it back for 2022. So essentially, leveling the playing field for value-based care across the entire home health agencies. Um, you know, you got an upside and a downside to it. So um, either they're going to be able to either, either these home health care companies are going to build their tool sets effectively to be able to manage this new world order, or I think we're going to continue to see more and more of this uh, mergers and acquisitions growth uh, kind of move forward as we go to 2022. Um, interesting thing will be what's going to happen in my mind is what's going to happen with telemedicine. And to your point, Jeff, and that's why CMS here in the States made the position is you can visit somebody, but you can't give them a bath. And home health is a personal touch in-home service. Um, But I think we're leaving a lot of uh, money on the table, so to speak, by not expanding the service set that home health can do. Integrating home health with PCS is an example um, where I think there's great opportunity. Integrating home health with the ability to do a higher level of care so, so we can take telemedicine into the home on a lighter touch process. So I think there's going to be some evolution around some of that as we go into 22 and 23, um, as we start to, to, to see um, how telemedicine fits into this new world ecosystem. But the challenges prior to now where people didn't take up telemedicine because of the uncertainty and the personal connection and that sort of stuff, well, didn't have a choice with COVID. And I think, you know, moving somebody quickly down the path is one way to, <laughs> one way to, uh, to, to, to get adoption. And that's exactly what happened. Um, yeah. So I think we're going to start seeing the evolution of that expand. And it, uh, with home health in particular, the combination of the three service lines with telemedicine is going to be uh, is going to be a lot of, uh, um, I think, a lot of value added to the overall uh, uh, clinical ecosystem. Yeah. And, you know, Dr. Joe, you were asking before how, you know, the single payer reality in Canada and Australia led to different um reactions through COVID. Um, One of the interesting things is, you know, reimbursement becomes reality in healthcare, right? As we all know. And one of the interesting things is any single payer market in a way is ultimately capitated, right? Now, does, does that mean all the actors have their incentives aligned in that direction? No, not necessarily. But uh, in the U.S., you have this historic difference between uh, skilled 
meaning episodic care, right? And long-term care being more synonymous with personal care. And of course, from a clinical point of view, that's not, that's not the right model. And so what we see in jurisdictions where you don't have that historic difference is, uh, you know, what is the right mix of services to support this, uh, this citizen? I'm not going to say patient, right? To support this citizen uh, at home through their, uh, their care journey. And uh, it is some mix of you know, personal care, nursing and therapy over time, not prescribed, not chunked into 60 day episodes, but, uh, you know, based on what I'm seeing of the patient in their home, what's the right intervention now to move them along their, uh, their care pathway. And so the absence of those silos, um, I can tell you from, from experience across these markets, uh, gives a lot of degrees of freedom, uh, in what type of care we deliver and then also how, uh, tools like telehealth and remote monitoring can be a part of the, uh, the care. Mix. You know, that last comment, Adrian, uh, triggered something in my mind and where I struggle um, in home health is that specific piece. Um, it's a scripted service. It has to fit in a specific box and it has to meet X, Y, and Z criteria. And the clinician has to do A, B, and C every time. Yeah. If we would stop thinking like that as a clinical so, clinical society and say, the patient, to your point, the patient needs services. What mm-hmm. those services look like across the continuum will likely change, but doesn't necessarily mean we have to chunk it into episodes and do this now and this later. Whereas yeah. if we would layer these and say, okay, let's take the care of the patient as the priority and you know parse the care according to their needs – I think we'd have completely different outcomes. And I think that the overall experience is going to be much better for the patient. But most importantly, I think we would take cost out of the system. Um, You know, when you take a look at we're giving everybody an apple pie when they may not want the entire pie, they just want a slice. Well, they're going to get the whole thing, whether they like it or not. And then we can't change that. And the incentives, to your point, are not aligned for home health. Either we meet all the criteria to get an episodic payment and make money or we get paired back to a per visit and we're underwater. So the incentives are almost misaligned to, to kind of take us down a continuum and kind of keep us boxed in, boxed in. That's, you know, when I start to think about the future of how value-based care may come into play, that's where I think human is thinking mm. and how they're looking to evolve the way that they're delivering care into the home to these members. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, the Burtzorg model. Right, the model of community nursing, where you know essentially you structure your care into pods, you know, nursing-led pods, but where you have um, also you know uh, uh, access to uh, to personal care services, and you really download the decision making as close to the to the patient as possible, right, and you give autonomy to these, uh, these nursing pods, right? It's originally a Dutch model that's been spreading around the world. And uh, in my view, having seen lots of models of how care can be organized and delivered, um, that's getting pretty close to optimal, at least for elder care, right? Okay, if I get a, you know, a hip surgery and I'm 40, that's maybe a different story. But um, uh, for elder care, that seems to be a, a beautiful model if you can sort it out. And the other thing that this helps with, I'm sure we're going to get into this topic soon, is from a a labor market point of view and the meaning of my work and uh, how fulfilled I am as an in-home caregiver. uh, Bertorg gets you to the community, not only a community with your clients, but a community with the rest of the care team that's servicing them. And I think there's a real magic if you can align, I mean, it's the caring profession at the end of the day, right? If you can empower and align people to work in a community, um, that's there's really magic there. And then the question is, okay, how do you roll that out through a health system as complex as, uh, as the U.S.? You know, I don't have those answers, but uh, I know there is some, I've seen that there is some magic there if you can really just get accountability into small pods uh, and into a community. 
You make up a, you, you bring forward a very good point. And I didn't know what we were doing back then. This was back in my Cigna days of 2000. We implemented the pod model. We used to call it physicians on demand. It was kind of a, a funny acronym, but exact same concept. What we discovered is patient populations don't traverse far from their central core. So we had the hub spoke with the clinics around it. Everything was cared for for that member within that pod. And everybody shared responsibility and accountability for the outcomes and the results of that population within that pod. Remove the barriers of physician communication and moving work downstream to the nurses appropriately. Um, and the uh, patient satisfaction and the overall, uh, to your point, that the caregiver satisfaction was sky high. Um, it was, you know, we didn't know it back then, but, uh, you know, it is a very effective model. Clinically speaking, it can be implemented. Now, not to the level that you're alluding to from a nursing care perspective, mm -hmm. but from a population health uh, perspective, it is very effective. That I can point to. The other really interesting model we see um, you know, internationally, when you look at Australia, a few years ago, they moved all publicly funding for um, uh, you know, elder care in the home to a client-directed model. Um, but, uh, but more uh, expansive than you'd see in some of the CDPAP programs under Medicaid. Uh, literally, you know, if I'm over 65 in Australia, I can get assessed by the public system get a, you know, be a level two package. Great. That gives me 30 K a year to spend on home care services writ large, right? I then go find a provider who I want to work with on this budget. And so they're competing uh, to, for my business. Now that I have my package with that provider, the mix of services can go from personal care to nursing to, you know what, if, if I, I have COPD, I mean, maybe the best 60 bucks you can spend on or best 120 bucks is a new air conditioner. That's in scope. So it's a, it's a very different model. And because the value, the, the dollars follow the patient and you give them some agency in the process, but matched with the oversight of these certified agencies, um, there's another bit of magic there, right? How you combine patient choice with, um, you know, a, a responsible clinical oversight model. That's really intriguing. And I have so many comments to make and so many questions around it. But we so do I. Hour. <laughs> because what, what immediately went to my mind on this one, Adrian, is that completely turns the table in regards to the incentives around compensation. Yeah. Because to your point, the money follows the patient as opposed to the money follows the clinician's decision. Correct. And in my mind, if patient, if companies are competing for that $30,000 to get your business, they can layer service on top of service on top of service, as opposed to what we have here in the U.S. is you get a chunk of change to do X. As long as you do X, you're good. Yeah. How much money you make doing it is up to you doing that. But there's no incentive to add Y and Z to that equation because monetarily I get no incentive to do so. Yeah. It turns the table completely and my mind is going crazy on why MA works and all that sort of stuff is because of that exact concept. Mm -hmm. Give the money to a to the private entity, and in this case, being the patient, and yeah. watch what happens yeah. with the competition of getting services in their hands. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, I, I, that's awesome from a healthcare perspective. It would seem to me like it's a very popular model uh, in in America as well. That uh, you have the control to spend your wallet as you as you see, except in healthcare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. healthcare. Healthcare is no. the one that's dragging behind all this now. Ma. They have that opportunity, but once again, they're catering the product based on the revenue that they're getting from CMS, but then also the different types of services and or um, healthcare, uh, healthcare uh, insurance product that they have to have in a specific market to get the membership. Um, not the same. You know, if you really look at it, what we're trying to do in the U.S. is move it from where we are now to a consumerism type of model, which is exactly what Adrian is alluding to. And I wish we would get there sooner. And Adrian, I'm curious if you have any knowledge on how that's going. I know the program's been in place since at least 2017 when I first found out about it. I yeah. would presume that um, fraud is is lower just because it's a more simple system of you qualify for package two. Here's your $30,000 check. Uh, go have fun. My question is um, when you empower people to spend their money on their own health, 
are they really, I know you said that there's a degree of oversight, but I'm curious if, um, if it leads to people not making the right personal choices, uh, but they're happy anyways, because they're, they're the ones that get to make those choices. Yeah. I mean, there's the, uh, you know, you hear a lot of chatter, at least when the program was being rolled out as like, oh, okay, this, you know, CHF patients just going to order a flat screen TV with their home care package. <laughs> and, you know, that's why, you know, you need the paternalistic, uh, you know, kind of top down. We know what's better for you better than you know what's best for you. Yeah. Um, in its actual implementation, um, the, so the program is popular. Um, it's not without its problems. Uh you know, there is a, a backlog of um, the packages that are like there's a waiting list for your home care packages, right? This is the flip side of, uh, uh, you know, a, a single payer is one way or another care ends up being rationed, right? Um, so so that's not perfect. Uh, there was a, a Royal Commission report. So, you know, basically think of that as like an Auditor General's report on the industry and, uh, you know, what came back wasn't, uh, wasn't flawless. Uh, and they're making some tweaks to the program. Uh, for example, the, the package used to go to the provider, right? Then at the end of every month, they'd send out a statement. But the, if you underspend your package, that money used to sit with a provider, which created a strange set of incentives. So now they've just rolled that back, right? Now it's basically become more like an authorization, right? Where it's it's postpaid for the services, but capped at uh, what you have in your package. So there are tweaks around the edge, around the edges that are happening. Uh, but for me, it is, uh, it's a very successful program. Uh, I know various provinces in Canada are looking at it. And uh, whenever I have an opportunity to have an opinion on it, um, I'm, I'm very bullish on that. I think... Um, uh, the other interesting thing, by the way, is that care management can be a billable service in the package. And if you look at what some people, you know, really need at that stage of life is like you actually need a proactive, you know, health system navigator for you because it's not just home care. You're going to need to know how to interface with the rest of the health system. So uh, th those degrees of freedom to me are just uh, net good. And, um, you know, again, like speaking to the U.S. ethos, uh, trusting the individual to make the right decisions um, with with their funds, you know, whether they're public or, you know, however the funds got there tends to have some good to it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> Dr. Joe, let's uh, switch gears. Let me ask you, um, what do you think is something in home health that is um, maybe a, a fairly common narrative or, or widely agreed, uh, agreed to, and uh, it's something that you may not uh, quite agree with? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, home health, I, I would say, home. one of the biggest ones that I hear uh, more often than not is, and I'm coming from the Humana side of the table, um, home health does not provide value and, or does not um, remove costs or improve outcomes. Um, I struggle with that comment quite a bit. Um, knowing uh, the population and knowing the aging population we have in the U.S. and um, the inability for uh, patients to see their clinician in a timely manner and the ability of the clinician to give them enough of their time to manage their uh, condition well, both in the office and at home, um, uh, is a challenge at best. The, 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 the ethos here in the U.S. is very focused on brick and mortar, go see your doctor, and you know I'm going to tell you what to do, and this is exactly what you need to do, and you're going to go home and do it. Um, get discharged from the hospital, same exact thing happens. What we fail as clinicians is that um, we assume that everybody understands what we're telling them. We assume they understand how and what they need to do. And we assume that they automatically are going to do it. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. And I can pretty much say throughout my career, it's been the, uh, been the norm. They, they don't have the level of understanding um, to, to help them navigate the, uh, everything. 
by taking the care to them in their home, we provide them the ability, one, to, the comfort, and then also um, the ability to ask uh, questions in a safe environment. And then also for us as clinicians to see things that we could never see before. Do they have food in their fridge? Do they have carpets mm-hmm. that are going to cause them the trip? Do they have air conditioning? Like, you know, Adrian was saying, these are all impacts. And if you take a look at it, 60 to 70 percent of the overall downstream uh, expenses are due to social components. So I don't care if you provide the absolute best care you can in the office or in the hospital. As soon as they go into their home, it can it, it can easily fall apart. And we're missing the biggest opportunity is to manage those patients in the home. And I think the other component of it is the the lack of our ability to follow patients longitudinally in the home um, is the other area. You know, everybody says back to where we were talking about the episodic components of it. The longer we maintain connection and engagement with the patients, the better the outcomes tend to be. Um, I, you know, and I'll give a point to an example specifically around uh, transition to care. Patients getting discharged from the hospital have a high propensity of readmissions unless they eat, unless they get a home health visit. And it can be either one visit with a medication reconciliation, or it can be several light touch visits over a co- course of a couple of weeks. It bends the cost curve dramatically with, uh, with readmissions downstream. We're missing that component of it. And I hear that a lot uh, in the uh, home health area. My answer to that is we should be looking at how to expand services in the home, get out of the box mindset and change the, 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 the paradigm from we only prescribe X to we want to care for you in your home, whatever that may look like. That's kind of the, you know, as, as I think about some of the, the, the things that I hear and, and, and don't agree with, that's where I kind of focus my thinking around is, you know, the, the, the things that we're missing in the home. Uh, because clinicians, I hate to tell you, we've got our head buried in the sand when it came, came to the home up until recently. And COVID accelerated a lot of that thinking. Uh, you know, if I were to tack on uh, one of the misconceptions, uh, let's say, in the, the general industry nav- uh, narrative in home care, um, I'll pick a slightly controversial one, right? The uh, Anyone who's in this industry right now uh, would describe it as a supply constrained, not a demand constrained market. Right, like caregiver shortages are absolutely at the top of the list of every provider everywhere in the world that we do business with, and uh, there are very real reasons for that. You know, I don't want to downplay all the uh, the very valid um, concerns. You know, whether it's uh, pay or uh, you know quality of work, or, you know, there's all sorts of things that make this a uh, make it a tough profession. And uh, there are just net net kind of shortage of caregivers. But um, what I think is largely missing here is if you were to really look at the aggregate demand and the aggregate supply, and if you could efficiently put that together, uh, you'd be much better off than what we're seeing in the industry. So my point of view on this is, and, and let me start with, with an illustration of this. Uh, you know, this is an industry with 60, 70 percent annual churn um, of caregivers. And when you interview uh, the median caregiver on the way out of the home care agency they're working for and you say, OK, why did you leave? The number one reason you get is I didn't get enough hours. I didn't get consistent hours. I didn't get hours that meet my preferences. And so, you know, why is this? Well, you know, imperfect scheduling of the the you know the, the clients and the uh, the caregivers I have within my agency, but even more than that is the fact that uh, the the agency is an artificial contract construct separating supply and demand. Okay, and so you might have you had a bird's eye view of uh, Toronto, you know, which for the most part we do. I have something like eighty percent of the care home care delivered in Toronto happens on our platform. Uh, if you look at that, I mean, you'll see a Bayshore care worker coming in and out of a home in North York, you know, 10 minutes before a St. Elizabeth uh, caregiver comes in and out of a home two doors down. And uh, so 
what we're really focused on now, I'm kind of getting to, uh, to where we see the industry going, but uh, one of the things that I think is hypercritical for the industry right now is to develop models where we can share that load better between agencies. And so our take on that uh, is a lie of market. So we do two things. First, uh, schedule optimization tools to make sure you're doing the best fits you can with the staff you currently have. But then it's that 10 to 20% where it's really hard. You, know, you spend 80% of your coordinator time filling that last 10% of visits. And our notion is, well, if you could post that, that case or that visit up to a marketplace and that could get picked up um, by a, a neighboring agency, uh, and you can have similar kind of quality controls as you would if it was your own caregiver going into the home. Uh, ultimately, you're going to have be able to create the perfect schedule more often for uh, for the care worker, and that's going to create capacity in the system, less travel time. You know, the ability to say, okay, I'm going to move a big chunk of my uh, caregiving population to guaranteed hours or full time employment because I know. If I can't fill 100% of that uh, that capacity myself in a given week, well, I can pick up a shift from the marketplace and um, you know make sure I fill that schedule. I think if we do that successfully as a as a technology provider, but also as an industry, we're going to drive down caregiver churn. It's going to become a more stable profession. Uh, it's going to become um, you know lower travel time, higher face time uh, kind of profession. And uh, so that's one thing we're really focused on. And I think uh, people who generally are in their kind of silos of my agency, my clients, my employees, um, you know, if we can take a step back and find a model um, for sharing, I think we'll be much better as an industry. I, 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 if I could do cartwheels here on, on audio, I would, because that's actually <laughs> really, really, really smart on trying to crack the nut in a different perspective. To your point, you know, these agencies are turning down 40, 50% of their business sometimes yeah. because of staffing issues. Yeah. Now that also alludes to one of the bigger challenges of what we're going to start seeing as home care expands. And you know, having come from the signifies of the world that crack the nut on logistics mm -hmm. of making sure the doc doesn't do uh, left turn, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and, and, and being able to route them effectively to hit eight patients in a day is not easy. Yeah. And you know, that once again, what we're up against is, as you decentralize care, you increase the, the drive time, windshield time, whatever you want to call it, and the impact on the ability to see more patients. Yeah. That They don't go hand in hand. And I think we're going to start seeing that more and more so as the hospital at home kind of takes traction and some of the home, more larger moves to, to bringing care into the home uh, evolves. Congregate setting in the U.S. was done for for the sole purpose of making staffing effective. I can take yeah. care of ten patients, fifteen patients in a in a couple hours by doing rounds in a in a hospital. Yeah. It'll take me three or four days to do so in uh, in the community, even in the best case scenario. Unless we leverage a pool of resources, or unless we leverage technology differently than we do so right now. Um, those are things that I think are going to really be an impactful, uh, be, I should say, are going to be extremely impactful to the evolution of where we're headed, mm -hmm. um, not only for home care, but as care in the home, so to speak, uh, evolves. Yeah. And my that, just, to, uh, just to build on that uh, for a second, you know, I'm going to talk more about the personal care side of the world, but I think you have a cohort of aides that want to work in a gig economy format and want that to be as friction-free as possible. And you've got a cohort that wants stable hours. And I think to succeed, you have to try and have be excellent at both and have a model for both and offer that. Uh, those two models have them work well together. And it is no easy feat, but uh, on, the, on the flip side, the technology tools at your disposal as a you know home care agency owner now are 10x what they were 10 years ago. So I think the industry is really ready to, to take this challenge on. The, the, uh, and when caregivers exit, when they say they haven't gotten enough hours, uh, another popular answer is the pay, but the pay was really tied to how many hours they got because they knew what they were signing up for on an hourly basis. And Adrian, as you talk about the schedule optimization, I see the, it almost brings it back to a Bertzerg model 
geographically where you might have a main caregiver and a main agency that you work with, but then you have these other um, caregivers that are close to you geographically that are picking up these gig shifts that, uh, you know, in, in most cases, it's better that than, than the, the visit going unfilled. Yeah. Yep. There's some, there's absolutely something to that. Yeah. Well, guys, we're almost bumping up against our time here. I'll get you out of here on uh, one last question. I'll start with you, Dr. Joe. Give us a reason to be optimistic about the future of home health. Um, I, to me, it's, this is where care is going. Um, it's been evolving since I first started healthcare when I when I finished uh, medical school in '98, and I've seen it evolve over the course of my career over 20 plus years. Um, and every step as I've taken has gotten closer and closer to the home. I'll, I'll take back to one conversation uh, we had with Clay Christensen back uh, when I was at Humana, who showed the evolution of IT and technology from the mainframes down to the cell phone in our hands, and laid that up against healthcare. Yeah. Starting with the large institutions, moving to the uh, to the uh, freestanding clinics, and then uh, now uh, in the home. The, the, his, his comment to the entire executive team at Humana was, "Care is going to the home. Um, it's the last evolutionary step. Um, you can choose to ignore it, or you can choose to be a champion of it. Um, I've chosen to be a champion of it. I think it's this probably to me is most exciting part of my career is watching this transition." and uh, being a part of uh, the evolution. So that's, that's what gets me up every day. Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, uh, it's an industry still with a ton of untapped potential. So, you know, if you contrast our business versus if I'm trying to help a merchant be better at e-commerce, I mean, there you got to be right at the edge of technology. Right, you have Amazon that's pushed the envelope, Shopify pushing the envelope. You're right at the edge of the capabilities of tools and software and user experience and so on. Uh, and home care, we're not at the edge. We have a lot, we just using the tools at our disposal today. There's a you know two x three x improvement in efficiency that can be had. That's not to say it's easy. Um, it's a, you know, our industry is a bit of a laggard for a reason. There's a ton of complexity, uh, there are disrupted value chains and the, all sorts of things. It's not easy, but, uh, the capacity for improvement I think is vast, um, because, uh, you know, we're still in catch up mode, honestly, versus some of the more forward, uh, areas of the economy. So I'm super, uh, super optimistic, at least of, uh, our role and what we can bring to the industry. Agreed. Well, I'm certainly doing, uh, as Joe would say, uh, mental cartwheels right now. You guys really brought a lot of value to this uh, episode. And uh, I want to thank you both for uh, being here today. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up sometime soon at a home health conference and uh, have a beer and uh, be in, in real life. <laughs> Sounds, great. Sounds great. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. guys. Jeff. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Home Health 360 is presented by Eliacare. First off, I want to thank our amazing guests and listeners. To get more episodes, you can go to eliacare.com forward slash home health 360. That's spelled home health 360 or search home health 360 on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. The easiest way to stay up to date on our new shows is to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We also have a newsletter you can sign up for on aliacare.com forward slash home health 360 to get alerts for new shows and more valuable content from Aliacare right into your inbox. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.